The Major Spoilers podcast covers news, reviews, and of course, spoilers, and goes into details about the topics discussed. So if you haven't read, listened, or watched the items we talk about, you might want to come back later. I'm Matthew. I'm Ashley. I'm Rodrigo. And I'm Stephen, and you're listening to the Major Spoilers podcast, the podcast for pop culture and comic fans. In this issue, things that go bump in the night and pull no narrative punches with the truly chilling adventures of Sabrina, stochastic investigations with Dirk Gently, magical mysteries in the ether, and revenant revelry in the form of Frankenbabe. Plus young Star Wars video games and the kick butt pole of the week. It's the time of the season for the scary scary, so turn out the lights, hide under a blanket, and prepare for the uncanny. For the Major Spoilers podcast is rising from the crypt. Welcome to issue 700 of the Major Spoilers. Wait a minute. Issue 700 of what? the Major Spoilers podcast? What? Wait. That's a big round that number. Happen? I don't know because these numbers always, first of all, I don't make a big deal out of hitting a big round number like this. Uh, so if people were like, oh, what are you going to do for 700? This is just going to be an episode. But uh, <laughs> I don't, you know, it just seems like yesterday we were sitting here celebrating uh, 600 issues. And that now we're at 700. Yesterday. We're going to yeah, blink. And it's, been, and it's been a really rough week. I know, right? Yeah, we're going to blink and we'll be up to 1,000 and we will surpass Batman. Batman. We will not surpass Batman. We will surpass Batman. No, we'll surpass. We we will oh, hit yeah. we will hit issue uh, one thousand uh, one hundred podcast before Batman hits one thousand one hundred issues. I'm not going to fight with you on our anniversary. No, it's going to be easy to just not an anniversary because <laughs> that would be July. Uh, Matthew is there, obviously. Hey, there's Rodrigo <laughs> lurking in the corner. Lurk, lurk, and of course Ashley Victoria Robinson. Mm-hmm. What's going on, Ashley? Not much, man. There's kids yelling outside. Ah, kids. I got kids yelling upstairs. Too much sugar. It's that time of year when kids get uh, too much sugar in their stuff. Sugar doesn't do that. Yeah, it does for my kids. So let us get to some news this week. The creator of the Chick Tracks has died. Young Lando Calrissian has been cast. And SAG after uh, goes on strike against video game companies. Let us spin that wheel of destiny. Let's see what we're going to talk about this week. And it lands right there on young Lando Calrissian has been cast. Well, hello there. What have we here? Donald Glover has been cast to play the young Lando. Nice. What do you guys think of that? Uh, the- so let me, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. They were like, uh, there's going to be more Star Wars stuff. And I'm like, eh. It's like, one of those projects is going to be a young uh, Han, Solo Han Solo project. And I'm like, even more, meh. And then they're like, we'll cast Donald Glover as Lando. And I'm like, all right, I'm listening. <laughs> like, this is, this is the first that I've heard of this project that is actually interesting to me. Well, we really haven't heard too much. We know who the actor is that will be playing Han Solo. But we don't know much about the story. But now that we throw Donald Glover into this mix, maybe it becomes a little bit more interesting. Ashley, what do you think? I don't know, man. Like, I'm not I'm not super interested in any of the Star Wars stuff that's retreading old ground. Um, so I was never going to go see the Han Solo movie. <laughs> and um, throwing Troy from Community in there is, is going to do nothing to make me go see it, mm, frankly. So okay. it, it does nothing for me. I don't see the necessity of it in any way. Um, it just screams a fan service. I'd rather just see something that has nothing to do with any of the characters I know, because it's basically like George Lucas's version of keeping up with the Kardashians, like space nepotism and their friends is getting a little old for me. Well, you know, I do kind of agree with you that there are some stories that maybe didn't, are not needed to be told. Uh, I think the upcoming uh, uh, Rogue One, I think, is going to be interesting. Um, but we do know what happens. But you at know the what end. happens I know, to they them. Get, they, get the, they get the plans to the princess <laughs> and all that stuff. So, yeah. But part of it, I think, too, is is the journey, right? Um, but this one, I kind of kind of agree with you. Unless they are coming up with a stellar story that's just going to blow our minds and not just a, well, kids, here's how old Han Solo got the Millennium Falcon. It's going to start mm-hmm. off with old uh, Han Solo before he dies. Spoiler alert. Wearing an eye patch, sitting in a Star Wars museum, no, uh, telling an, telling a little kid, "Hey, let me tell you the story of how I made the Kessel Run in twelve parsecs." I know, I know, it's a unit of time, not distance. Shut up, let me tell you my story. 
That's what's going to, if it's that, then no, I'm not interested. <laughs> Parsec is a unit of distance, not time. Right, right, but in right, any right. case. Shut up and listen to my story. Right. You want to hear this or not? George Here's Lucas is on the line. You want me to bring him in on this? Here's the thing. <laughs> this is, this is my, my in, completely inessential take on it. They're going to make these movies. Oh, sure. Uh, they're, they're, they're going to suck all of the blood out of this franchise. And they're going to get their 70 scribillion dollars out of it. And that's fine. But when you say to me, we're going to make a Star Wars movie, I'm like, okay, what's it about? Then they won't tell us. And I'm like, okay, well, who's in it? Yeah, I think that having an actor like Donald Glover involved is something that is definitely designed to pander to nerds. And I also think that's kind of fine. Because when you really break it down, you're going to have different audiences going to different bits of these Star Wars movies. And maybe this is the one where your hardcore fans can get in and see whatever it is that happened for, for Orlando to lose his ship to Han or whatever they're going to tell yeah, the story. He lost it is. in a card fight, in a card, uh, uh, card game. Card yeah, but that's, fight. That's card no fight. longer active. No, that's, that's Expanded Universe. They threw that out. But no, if, you're telling somebody, if you're telling somebody's backstory... Oh, was that in the movie? I don't think yeah. that was in the movie. I think you're extrapolating. But if you're going to tell somebody's backstory, if you're going to do this movie, and if there's a possibility of it ending up being a paint by numbers, here's a story of what happened behind the scenes that you don't know, then I want people in it who are going to do weird, interesting stuff. And whatever you can say about Donald Glover, he makes interesting acting choices. Mm -hmm. Now, the inter one of the interesting things is this is going to have to take place way before any of the other movies that have uh, come about. Uh, it's, uh, well, it's going to have to take place between the first three episodes, I would Im imagine. But um, we have already seen uh, Lando in uh, Star Wars Rebels. Uh, he mm -hmm. was in, what, season two or was it last season, mm -hmm. Ashley? Do you remember? I believe it was last season. Because yeah, yeah. Last season was season two. Okay. All right. right? Yeah, 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 I think so. Something but like that. But nothing good they, happened they in season, season one, so it can't possibly be season one. Yeah, yeah. So they split those seasons up weird on the uh, Disney Channel. But anyway, at some point after he abandons becoming a smuggler and a ne'er-do-well with his buddy old Han Solo, uh, Lando goes off and becomes a, um, a minor, and that's where he appears in the Star Wars Rebels universe on uh, Lothal. Um, and then he helps the Rebels in that way before he becomes, what is uh, what is his title over there in Cloud City? Baron Administrator of uh, Bespin, I believe. Baron Administrator of Cloud City, yep. Uh, and then, um, you know, then we kind of know what happens there. So I'm kind of interested in this. I'm really more interested in the story. And until I know what that story is, I can't say whether I'm super excited or not excited. But when it comes to a, a slick-talking uh, ne'er-do-well, I think Donald Glover's probably okay to play, play Lando. Yeah. And interestingly, although I, I didn't even really think about it, if you go by the age of the actor, Han Solo was 35, 37 years old at the time of Star Wars. So if you've got like a 20 year old playing it, you're probably at least a decade back into that time frame. There are definitely things you can do there that aren't just going to be rehashing a Star Wars or rehashing oh. an expanded universe story. Yeah, but bet you Darth Vader shows up, though. Impossible. Oh, yeah. Darth uh, Vader will show way. up, and then since this will be after the Rebel, or not Rebels, but Rogue One, uh, that lady will show up. Mm -hmm. uh, Boba. Boba Fett will show up, or his well, ship will you guys, show up. Have any of you guys or gals read um, Timothy Zahn's Scoundrels book? Yeah. No. You have, Matthew? Mm-hmm. Oh, is it good? Because the, eh. the, the, the log line for it, or the tagline for it, where they're just giving you the short one-sentence description of it, Makes it sound like that's something that I would definitely go see that movie. If it's Zahn, Ocean's Eleven in space in Star Wars, I would see that. Zahn for me is definitely a, hey, look how, look how pretty I'm writing, Mama. Look at all these cool references kind of guy. So it kind of depends a little bit on your take on Timothy Zahn. I liked it okay. It's not something that I would go back and read over and over and over like uh, Tales of the Bounty Hunters. That was awesome. Mm, okay. That also told Han Solo's backstory and, and why Dengar hates him. Mm, Dengar, Dengar, I don't, you know, Dengar, the guy yeah, with yeah. the bandages on his head. He yeah, was there yeah. for like five seconds. Mm -hmm. Fell into the sarcasm. Dengar like totally hates him. Yeah. No, no, no. That's Bob A. Fett. Oh, okay. It's his wife, uh, Django Fett. Oh, wait, never mind. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Listeners, we will keep you up to date on this story as uh, events progress. Keep it right here. Major <laughs> Spoilers Podcast. Breaking news. 
Donald Glover is currently on my television right now in a community episode trapped in Colonel Sanders space camp. More news as events warrant. All right, listeners, you can head over to Majorspoilers.com and read more about these stories. And if you want to hear us have a discussion about uh, chick tracks and their rise in pop culture-iness, become a, a VIP <laughs> or a patron over at Patreon.com slash Majorspoilers, where you will have access to bonus conversations all about the chick tract. Okay, I think we're done with news. Uh, why don't we head into what's next? Some reviews. <laughs> I don't know how many of you had a chance to check out Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency, the first episode that dropped uh, this past week on BBC America. Being a huge that the thing with Frodo. Yes, it is the yep. one with Frodo in it. Uh, being a huge Douglas Adams fan and having interviewed um, the uh, producer of this uh, series not too long ago, he's also writing the comic book of um, of uh, uh, Dirk Gently for IDW Publishing. I knew I had to watch this show. Now, this show does uh, star um, uh, Frodo Baggins. Um, Elijah Wood. Elijah Wood. Yeah. <laughs> he does a. You know, I will say this. He does a fantastic job as as his character in this show. He doesn't play Dirk Gently. He plays this guy that Dirk Gently stumbles upon and Dirk forces into his life as um as this guy's life really comes unraveled as Todd's life comes unraveled. Can we appreciate too that he is now playing a Douglas Adams character and Martin Freeman, who played Bilbo Baggins in The Hobbit, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, also played a very famous Douglas Adams yeah, character. Yeah. It's a nice little uh, verisimilitude there. It is. There's yeah. only there's only eight actors. <laughs> only eight hobbits. They changed their names for uh, tax purposes here. Now this is the first episode of an ongoing series from BBC America. I don't know how many are in total. I want to say like maybe six or seven. Um, the first episode to me is off to a rocky start. Matthew, if I said describe mm -hmm. Dirk gently to me, you would say, mm -hmm. uh, Dirk gently is a large, broad shouldered, unpleasant man in an ugly hat who wanders around and everyone kind of hates him, including the uh, guy who writes the horoscopes for his local paper. Yeah. So, uh, that is not what Dirk gently looks like at all in this series. Uh, if you're familiar oh. with mm. the, uh, and I don't remember the actor's name who's playing Dirk gently off the top of my head. But if you've seen the TV series Silicon Valley, the assistant guy, the actor that plays the assistant, it looks just like him. Very skinny, very thin, um, and a little bit hyper. It really, I mean, the actor is fine that's, that's playing Dirk gently, just doesn't come off as Dirk gently. Mm. And there's a whole bunch of other weird stuff. There may be some vampires involved in this thing that are sucking your life force, some literal life force vampires. There is a, uh, Dirk mm -hmm. Gently is the holistic detective. There is also, I forget the, this other character's name, but she is the holistic assassin. She just kills anybody that she wants because somehow it's all connected. It's, what? it's really strange. It's got some quirkiness to it, which I really dig. The general mystery around this is that there was a murder in this hotel that Todd worked at and he subsequently got fired. Um, he may somehow be involved with it, the police think, but nobody knows for sure. Um, for the first episode, I don't know. I was really gung-ho about it, very excited about this. The acting is fine. I just think there's some weirdness going on here that doesn't feel like a Douglas Adams, uh, Dirk Gently tale. It's written by, it's written, uh, by Max Landis. Uh, and well, there's, may, there's why it doesn't feel like an Adams. It, there are some times where it does feel a little bit like Adams, but for the most part, it feels like Max Landis. Max, uh -huh. Max Landis, yeah. So whether you love the guy or hate the guy, that may influence whether you watch this show or not. But the first episode for me was not out of the gate in a flash. It was more of a mediocre trot. So I'm giving Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency episode one Two and a half slices of meatloaf. I'm hoping it builds up speed. I know that there's some aspect of time travel that's going to pop up in the next couple of episodes because they hinted at it here. That's what I'm interested to see what happens. But right now, this is a very mediocre start to this series. I hope it gets better. It airs on Sunday on BBC America. You can get it via various online things. I know I didn't tell you too much about the show, but it's hard to explain. It really is. But, mm -hmm. but there you go. Um, would I, I would not recommend rushing out in a, uh, in a watching frenzy to watch this thing. <laughs> See, whenever Adams describes Dirk gently, I literally picture Stephen Fry. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Like, well, you know, 80 Stephen Fry, big, tall, broad shouldered Stephen Fry with the nose and the voice and the thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
I think the guy that was on the BBC's um, Dirk Gently series back in early 2000s, uh-huh. I thought he did a really good job and had a look to Dirk Gently. But this guy is just like the guy in this current series, just like a a, a, a beanpole guy. Very Looks like his name is Samuel Barnett. Yes. And I just heard an interview with him uh, today. Mm-hmm. And he's a nice guy and he's a good actor, yeah. but I just don't think he's Dirk Gently. He looks so really this. like. Benedict Cumberbatch in these pictures. No, he doesn't even look like Benedict Cumberbatch. So does this uh, does this series take place in Britain or has it been that's trans- the other, that's the other thing, it to the United States? Has been transplanted to your hometown, Rodrigo. <gasps> no, no, I'm sorry, Col- Portland. You're in Seattle. It, this takes place in, in. No, it does take place in Washington. It does I thought you were talking about Shaker Heights, Ohio. I'm no, like, no. what? No, they've transplanted uh, yeah, it to uh, the Pacific Northwest. I was say, now they shot like, it in. Well, in a strange move, they've instead of making it take place in London, they've moved it to Mexico City. No, no, no. <laughs> I'd pay nice. to see I'd, that. I would watch that. Yeah, <laughs> it would be interesting. Dirt but jelly. no, this does take place in the Pacific Northwest. I mean, it's shot in Vancouver, um, but I believe it takes place in Seattle. Looks like this feller was Renfield in Penny Dreadful. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. Two and a half slices of meatloaf. We'll see. I'll, I'll give you just a quick update next week if I think it improved or not. So there you go. Uh, oh, Ashley, let's jump mm-hmm. to you next. I am super curious about this movie. We were sent a screener copy. Doomed yeah. the movie. So this was something that I was going to review two weeks ago and then did a comic instead and then wasn't on the show. So I'm getting my life together and I'm talking about it now. So Doomed the movie is a documentary about, you know, what the heck ever happened with that Roger Corman Fantastic Four movie that we've all watched on YouTube, like inebriated in a college dorm no we've never seen it because it would be illegal to watch yeah i've never seen it never or that. Oh. <laughs> um or or we bought it a con with one of those like world papery covers on them because they're always in the back <laughs> with like the italian spider-man and the japanese and spider-man uh, nsa um, we don't know her <laughs> <laughs> and that um, indian I'm an spider-man immig- yes I love yeah. that guy. i'm an immigrant i'm already on the nsa's list i got no <laughs> secrets to hide um but so the cool thing about the documentary is it's way better quality than that movie is. <laughs> so it, ha- it has all of that going toward it. Um, it's directed by Marty Langford. And you can definitely, definitely tell that he is really passionate about the subject matter, which is great because otherwise I think this documentary would have been a bit of a bust. It weirdly starts with Chris Gore, which I thought was especially strange because I know him. And he wasn't involved in the movie in any way. Um, But I guess he was like their quote on set reporter at the time. And it sort of goes along with a bunch of people who were involved in the production, including, I mean, Roger Corman's in it, all the actors are in it, director, sound guy, PA, like anyone they could grab from this movie apparently wanted to talk about it. And you really get to see the drive and the passion that went into this project, which is amazing. And it's what, It's what we all want to go into these heroes and these stories about these properties that we love. And unfortunately, sort of as they roll into the story of production and what happened and how it came together, you can really see the shortcomings of a Roger Corman production in particular Um, in their studio, for example, um, which was uh, condemned. There were like rats that ran around while they were sound editing and stuff like that. Um, so on the one hand, you have to have mad respect for the fact that they made this movie and they made it with great care and diligence, but on the other hand, it's still a disaster Mm -hmm. and there's still a ton of terrible casting choices. Um, all the actors are people who like work Mm -hmm. and they all seem very nice and like, they're all very enthusiastic about talking about it. But like, if you've seen the movie, like, you know, it's not good. Um, it does what a documentary is supposed to do. It really sucks you into the subject matter. The where it sort of falls apart is it's about a half hour too long. Mm. Um, So they tell about making the movie and then they talk about how they basically out of their own pockets um, expensed a a press tour and they went to comic conventions and they talked about this movie and then it kind of gets really boring because you know, the movie never came out and uh, you don't care that they went to San Diego, you know, whatever the movie never came out. Um, They also do, shine a very negative light on Stan Lee. Hmm. Now I am not a person who's who holds up Stan Lee as one of the great gods of the world. Um, but he's definitely, I think a figure to be respected and revered. 
Um, and they, Marty Langford, the director actually asked him to, to be involved in this documentary and he did not. So everyone involved with the movie said that like Stan brought donuts to set and he was super into it. And then they cut it with footage from San Diego Comic-Con when it was really tiny and just in like a hotel ballroom, um, of Stan Lee saying that the movie would never be coming out and it wasn't very good. Mm. Um, the truth, like everything lies somewhere in between, but I thought it was rather interesting because now that. Uh, Stan is is an older gentleman. Everyone seems to treat him with a great amount of respect due to what he's created and in accordance with his age. Um, so it does, again, toward the back end, it, it gets this really malicious streak where for the most part, it's a very enthusiastic and uplifting documentary. And it makes it, it made me more interested in seeing this movie that I've already seen and I know is not very good um, than I had ever been in the past. So if you have seen this movie, I, if you've seen the Roger Corbett Fantastic Four, it's worth checking out Doomed because it explains a lot of the weirdness that we saw and it will give you a new appreciation for what actually made it into the final cut. If you like the Fantastic Four or filmmaking, I would also say this is worth watching because it shows you what can be done um, with such restraints, even if it doesn't wind up getting a wide release in the end. And then you can plan your thousand dollar movie based on what you've seen. <laughs> um, and if you like documentaries, I'd say check it out because for the most part, it is just talking heads, um, but they're interesting talking heads. So I would definitely recommend checking this one out. And I am going to give it four and a half slices of the old meatloaf, which you can probably oh. construct together in a Ben Grimm style costume. Excellent. Cool. I think I will watch this uh, documentary then. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you for that, Ashley. Uh, Rodrigo, what is Dark Horse offering up? This is an advanced uh, review, isn't it? It is, and it's it came separately from their other reviews, mm -hmm. um, which which was interesting. I'm looking at Ether number one, mm -hmm. uh, which is Matt Kind Kent Kent. I don't know K I N D T. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, David Rubin. And what drew me to this is that um, I've seen David Rubin's art before, and it is very cool. Um, so that's, that's kind of why I was, I, I kind of did a double take and I'm like, is this that guy with the, like the Aurora West comic, um, which is the one I've seen before and, and, and I'm pretty sure it is. Um, so it's, uh, I can't, uh, spoil too much about it because we're like in front of the, uh, embargo side of things. Um, but, uh, it is the story of a scientist who goes to a magical world and is trying to like science it he's trying to like explain how all of these like clearly insane magical beings and situations and things happen um and and that he's saying that they can all be explained through science um it's pretty interesting um he gets involved in a murder investigation pretty much right away. They give you a lot of uh, quick little brief glimpses into just how crazy weird this world is. Um, you get some shots of this like super giant city, which is actually to me very reminiscent of Chowder. Um, mm. If you guys have if you guys mm -hmm. have seen the the cartoon Cartoon Network show the Chowder, are all fabric. Yeah, and like people walk through them, but they don't actually move, right? Uh, no, th that doesn't happen here. But there's something about this, like, like pink and blue pastel city that they inhabit that is that is very, very reminiscent of that. Um, I mean, it, I, I'm interested to see what happens. Um, and the art is very cool. Uh, like problems with it. Uh, like right away, you start meeting characters. And you don't meet any ladies. Uh, and it would have been easy to introduce. In fact, uh, there's kind of by the end of the book, two female characters introduced. And they're kind of not directly impacting the story, except like they're actually, in fact, indirectly impacting the story. Right. Um, I know it's it's very hard to talk about it in broad terms, but. It's like they are not actors. They are kind of plot devices. Mm. Um, so that's unfortunate. Again, you know, you're going into, you know, they talk about, you know, uh, 
you, anytime you talk to certain people about uh, comic books and like superhero movies and stuff, they're like, well, why would they make this character a lady or this character a different race or something? Just make something brand new. Um, but it's like, even when they make something brand new, the main character ends up being a white, uh, white dude between 30 and 40, mm-hmm. you know? So I don't know. I, I mean, I don't mean to like, I don't mean to take this comic and put my soapbox on top of it necessarily, but you know, you're going in brand new property and all this stuff. And it kind of, uh, doesn't show a very like diverse view of things despite the fact that it's set in a mystical, crazy times world. Um, that said, again, this is just the first issue. They did send us the first two issues, but I thought to myself, man, if I can't spoil things from the first one, like I don't even want to get into the second one right now because they'll be mad at me. So uh, <laughs> I am still, despite my uh, slight reservations on it i'm gonna give it uh three and a half slices of meatloaf i mean it is well above average it looks really good um i'm a big fan of this art style um it's also reminiscent of uh the uh kill six billion demons kind of look as well it's uh, which is crazy to say it's like somewhere between that nonsense and chowder's nonsense like somewhere between that is this and if you're into either of those properties you should probably check out uh ether All right, cool. Thank you for that, Rodrigo. And Matthew, what do you bring to the table this week? I got me a comic book. Okay. You know how uh, my colleagues are often accused of only loving Marvel, DC, or Dark Horse? I am here to tell you that is not true. They love only themselves. But I, (laughs) I will read anything that you put a staple in. Which is actually how my wife uh, managed to get me married. She put a staple in a marriage license, and I'm like, oh, look at this, and a pretty ring, too. Nonetheless, this week I have from 215 Inc., issue number three of Franken-Babe, because it's almost the Halloween, and I like to be topical, even though Stephen hates it when I do this. So, blah, topical. Okay, Franken-Babe number three comes after Franken-Babe number one and two. I have not read Franken-Babe number one and two as part of my theory that when you enter any comic, I kind of want to get a feel for it, and then I can go back and read number one and two and go, hey, this is awesome. This is a big kind of arc-wrapping, fighty-fighty story, but it starts at the delightfully named Fibes Asylum for the Delightfully Mad, where 50 years ago, a man named Dr. Macabre was imprisoned forever because he was evil in a way that the city doesn't like. Now, this city is filled with monsters and creatures and the uh, titular Franklin babe, titular being a pun on three or four different levels. And we see the first few issues of the comic focusing entirely on Dr. Macabre over the course of decades and how he's still stuck in this asylum. Then we smash cut to Franklin babe fighting the evil Mr. Sin, who seems to be a giant horned red demon, And they fight, and they fight, and they fight. There's not a whole lot of context to the fight other than her referencing that she somehow owes him a soul and wants to know if he'll do like a uh, pay-on-demand thing, which is kind of nice. But the fight ends up in a hardware store called Texas Chainsaw Massacre run by a man named Tex. I laughed out loud at that bit. And then more fighting, more fighting, more fighting. I do really like the art. When I was a youngster, back in the 1990s, I used to watch something called Liquid Television, which was basically the cartoon version of an independent comic from the 80s. This book reminds me of that translated back into comics. It's really kinetic. It's really frenzied. And everything about it just has kind of a a handmade independent vibe, which I truly, truly love. The parts of it that don't necessarily work for me are the story itself is really kind of, and then, and then, and then we start with that slow moment of this is the man and he's been in prison for 50 years and then bam fight. And then the fight ends because she happened to put on a brassiere that had guns in it. Um, so that happened And then as the issue wraps up, we have the evil Mr. Sin taken into custody and taken to the Fibe Sanitarium. 
And this is on page 20 of 22, and I read to you verbatim. Oh, yeah, everyone remember the hordes of angry zombies yet to be vanquished? So there's a zombie attack going on in the midst of all of this that is not in any way hinted at in the beginning of the book. So I definitely do want to go back and read issue one and issue two now to see if it's all like this. And of course the book ends with a cliffhanger coming up into issue four, which does bring uh, the, the question of uh, Dr. Macabre into play. This is the weird thing. I like this book. I like what they're doing, what they're trying to do. And I really love the, the, the feel of an independent book because you're, not necessarily doing something like this to make a scribillion dollars and make a movie. You're doing this because you love comics and you want to make some. So I don't want to be super harsh about it, but there are some storytelling issues in terms of the plotting here that really knock your teeth down your neck as far as trying to read and understand this book. The art is interesting. It's very quirky. And there are points where it does just beautiful things. And there are points where I'm just like, wait, you know, what had happened? I'm I'm not always following the storytelling and the fact that, you know, the main character is a reanimated prostitute named Franken Babe is fun in kind of an Andy Warhol Frankenstein must die kind of way. But there's also elements of that that in the back of my head are just tweaking and going, man, this could go badly. And her secret weapon are guns in her bra. So all in all, um, Slightly below average, two out of five slices of meatloaf. It is a an okay book. It's definitely a book that I want to see more of. It's definitely creators that I want to see more, especially the artist. Uh, written by, hang on, I had this. It's on my script over here. Got to push this button. Go over there. Just cut that part out. Written by Joe Badone. Uh, art, no, written by Matthew Johnson. Art by Joe Badone. Really an interesting book. I don't know if I'd recommend it so much as a rush right out of a buying frenzy, but it's definitely interesting. It's definitely experimental, and there are things to like here. So I'd be interested in seeing more from these creators from 215 Inc. and theoretically from Frank and Babe. So we, we can definitely see where it ends up. Cool. All right. Frank and Babe was actually the doctor. Frank and Babe. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you, sir, the person correcting me on this point, are the real monster. <laughs> Listeners, you can head over to Majorspoilers.com. You can check out even more reviews over there. And, hey, we've got uh, Rand's uh, Random Access Memory coming up uh, this week for the month of October. Oh, what does Rand remember from 40 years of comics history and reading? You'll have to find Uh, out in his October installment of Random Access Memory over at Majorspoilers.com. Also over at Majorspoilers.com, it's the Major Spoilers Poll of the Week. Poll of the Week, 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 week. Uh, so maybe you guys have heard, uh, Nintendo's big news came out last Thursday. They got a new game system on the way. It's called the switch. It's a part console, part <laughs> handheld device. They're really ready to switch up the game. To me, it looks like a cross between the uh, 3ds and the Wii U. Uh, but it seems like a lot of people are pretty excited about this. Uh, so the big question this week is, will you buy the Nintendo switch? Rodrigo, you probably are the most uh, uh, up on this of, of all of us. Uh, maybe. Uh, so uh, the answer, the short answer is yes, because I basically bought every Nintendo console, mm-hmm. uh, like every Nintendo home console ever, at, like unless you count the <laughs> Virtual Boy. Um, and that, and that is... Yeah, and that and that includes the Wii U, which you know, perf- like definitely underperformed. So when they when you see that uh, pie chart of like who bought the Xbox One, the PS4, um, and then like the little sliver of the Wii U, that what that was me. Um, the I think the Switch looks really interesting. I think that it's one of those things where like the Wii U kind of needed to happen for mm-hmm. us to get to the Switch. Mm-hmm. Um, and once again, Nintendo is just like banking so hard on this basically on this gimmick um but in the same sense the wii was banking really hard on this gimmick and it became at the time at least the number one selling console ever and it took a long time for it to get dethroned i'm not entirely sure if it has 
Um, yeah, I, I haven't think, checked uh, the numbers. I think, uh, I think PS4 think, passed it already. Yeah, I, I think it has. But I mean, it was it was a game changer you know everybody rushed to put motion controls basically the wii is responsible for motion control and other stuff and the connect um which means they're responsible for paranormal activity for pretty much uh. so <laughs> so yeah i mean i i'm very interested in what they do and i'm definitely going to want to play the next smash the next mario kart the next super mario the next zelda so eventually, even if I can't get it right away, I'm going to end up getting the Switch. Yeah, there's a lot of questions on this system. Like when you go portable, how long is the battery going to last? Right, right. Uh, battery it, life is something they haven't talked about. And right. it's, it's a it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you're going on the road, uh, you know, for me, this is something we will probably end up with depending on the price. Uh, it's too bad it's not coming out in time for Christmas because it would certainly be under the tree. But coming out in March of 2017, this is not going to be a fast buy for us. Um, but the kids love playing video games in the car. And if this allows them to do that without me having to listen to everything going through the uh, sound system of the car, um, this could be a kind of a big deal. But if, if we're 10 miles down the road, not even to Russell yet, and the batteries are going dead on this thing, that's kind of a make or break deal for me. The other one's going to be the price, and that's the one thing that we haven't really seen a, a definite on. A lot of people are saying if it's more than two ninety nine, nobody's going to buy this thing. And yet, I believe GameStop on their European site had it listed for um, Euro dollars. I believe of uh, um, was it four ninety nine or something, which I guess is like five hundred bucks uh, U.S., mm -hmm. which is making it kind of pricey. So I don't know, Ashley. Are you a gamer? Do you you play video games? Are you interested in in buying the Nintendo Switch? I have never purchased a gaming console, and I don't imagine that changing because I'm terrible at video games. So, no. <laughs> but I'm, like, utterly the wrong person to ask. No, I understand. I mean, uh, for me, we got the Wii because it was fun for my kid to stand there and, and wave his hand around while he was pretending to bowl. Um, mm -hmm. The Wii has not gotten a lot of attention in our household over the last couple of years because they've both figured out how to play Xbox games. And both of the kids are eating it up on the Xbox. Um, so I don't know if, if the Wii is even going to, the, the switch is going to be something that they'll be into the boy, the, the oldest still plays the 3ds all the time. So this still may be something that's up his alley. I don't know. It's, it's weird. Matthew, you are uh, kind of a late adopter into, um, video game systems. I think you're still playing oh. with the, the PS2 or something and you have, I have the, a PS3 and a Wii U, the galaxy or mm -hmm. whatever, the mm -hmm. Nintendo galaxy or my N64, GameCube, sorry. my N64 GameCube, my bottom. I had a game. Play. My N64 is hooked up in the bedroom so that I can play WrestleMania 2000 and Mario Kart 8 uh, when the mood strikes. But we have a Wii U. We had a Wii before that. Mm -hmm. I imagine that there are two reasons why the, my answer is yes. One, I will probably upgrade when the games upgrade because mm -hmm. we do follow. We follow Mario Galaxy. Mm -hmm. We have a Smash. We have, you know. A few games, uh, the Let's Dance series, Widget loves, and the uh, uh, the karaoke series, she loves. And secondly, uh, Sarah has a tendency to go and buy us video game consoles for Christmas because Sarah makes a ton of money and doesn't have a lot of money to spend things on. So I imagine that next Christmas we will likely get a Nintendo Switch because that's how we got the Wii U. What what is but, the what is the what is the <laughs> game? What is the launch day game that would make you rush out on day one to buy this, Rodrigo? Oh, uh, actually, if they had a solid uh, turn-based RPG, that would probably do it. If they had a uh, Fire Emblem title at launch, I might actually consider it. Because hmm. the, what they're showing is the new Zelda game. Right. Yeah, Breath of the Wild. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, they they're also showing uh, Skyrim Remastered. Uh huh. I saw so that too. So that's that's actually that's actually important because a big problem that both the Wii and the Wii Wii U had was not a lot of third party support. But mm -hmm. so far, a lot of third party uh, developers have said that they've kind of looked over the specs for the Switch and they're interested. Some of them have already thrown in, like Bethesda. And some of them are like being like, yeah, 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 pretty much. So this this could be a big switch, a big part of the reason why your kids are so into Xbox stuff and not so much at the Wii U is because all of these games are constantly coming out. So they're bound to mm -hmm. like something, mm -hmm. whereas the Wii and Wii U have this like much smaller uh, 
Ooh. carousel of games mm-hmm. because they're mostly just Nintendo games. Right. Um, but if the Wii U gets that third party, or not the Wii U, but the Switch gets that third party support, it could actually really compete with the uh, Xbox and PS4. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If Matthew, there's a is, Zelda is it, game, we may actually get it. I, I was wondering, would it be Zelda. Zelda or would it be the new Grand Theft Auto? For me, uh, I'd go for Street Fighter versus Legion of Superheroes. Uh-huh. <laughs> if they had Grand Theft Auto on a Nintendo, mm-hmm. yeah, you'd have me because that would that would mean I could phase out my PS3. But I I don't know if Rockstar is working with anything. You know, I I just heard about the new Red Dead Redemption game, yeah. which means we're probably not going to get a Grand Theft Auto title out of them for a year or two. Yeah. So I mean, if there's a Zelda involved, my wife may want it. Mm-hmm. And if the price point is, you know, if it's not five hundred dollars, I I might be willing to actually spring for that for a birthday. She has yeah. a, a February birthday, which means you know, going into March, I could get her the new Zelda on the, on a Switch. Yeah. As a as a late birthday gift, I think I think from what Nintendo shown, I think it's guaranteed that we're getting the new Zelda and probably yeah. uh, the Skyrim remaster too. So, yeah. I I don't think they wouldn't show it if they weren't. Uh, I, I I'm pretty I'm pretty sure they've I'm pretty sure they've straight out up said that uh, the Breath of the Wild is going to be a launch title for the Switch. Mm-hmm. And um, cool. also, are, are we also thinking uh, Mario Kart's also on this. Uh, definitely the new, like, uh, straight up Super Mario title, whatever that ends up being. So the equivalent Mario. of Mario Galaxy or Mario, Mario Sunshine. Mario Tennis. Yeah. yeah. Whatever it be. Yeah. Um, and uh, also Game Freak has said that they will make uh, Pokemon games. And the Pokemon mm. company have said that they are, they're going to make Pokemon games for the Switch. So that's eventually going to move off of the 3DS, which has had, like, huge longevity for oh, a... Yeah. Uh, for a system, yeah. Yeah, for, yeah, for any system, really. Um, and eventually it will all just kind of funnel into the switch since it's both that home console and portable. Yep. Matthew, how's everyone voted so far this week? Right now, there are very few votes in the bag, but uh, 54 votes, actually 61% of people saying, no, they won't be buying the Nintendo switch, but a good solid 40% saying yes, they're going to, or they're con- going to consider it. So I would say that on this sample size, that's, so more successful than I expected. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Cool. I, I expected more people to just say, no, don't want it. It's got a toaster in it. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like a little puppy. If you look at the, yeah, controller. it's like a little like googly eyed puppy with floppy ears. It's like, hi, come play All with right, me. Well, then somebody's going to buy it just because of that. Well, Listeners yep. rush right over right now in a voting frenzy. To Majorspoilers.com, dot com, cast your vote in the Major Spoilers poll of the week. If you're listening, if you're looking for some new earbuds, might I suggest Tweaked Audio? TweakedAudio.com is got you covered. Uh, they have everything for your ears that'll make your sound sound great. You can check them out whether it's uh, different colors or different styles, or microphones built in, or uh, cool things for your uh, sports traveling stuff. I like Tweaked Audio, and you will too. TweakedAudio.com is the place to go. When you use the checkout code MAJOR at Tweaked Audio, you will get 33% off your price. I'm not saying go out and buy in a buying frenzy for all of your holiday friends, but uh, oh, Tweaked Audio. I'm not, not saying it either. Yeah, TweakedAudio.com is the place to go. All right, it is the holiday uh, season. The best holiday of the year, Halloween. And uh, this is our last Major Spoilers podcast before Halloween. <sighs> Which means we can talk about The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina from Archie Comics, written by Roberto Aguirre Sacasa, with art by uh, Robert Hack. Yep. Um, what's going on here, Matthew? You've, you've uh, been following this for quite some time. Yes, I followed this from uh, release because I'm like, holy moly, what is this going to be? Basically, you may remember Sabrina, the kooky, cartoony teenage witch from uh, probably like, I think, 1970-something. Well, who most used to do, remember her from the ABC uh, sitcom series. Well, you can do that too from the nineties. I'm just saying, I'm talking about comics. I don't care about your TV, about your adaptations, about your, your Frank from MST three K voicing the worst puppet cat ever. I don't, don't care about none of that. No. Well, you probably do. Please feel free to forget everything you know about Melissa Joan Hart before you pick up Sabrina, the teenage witch. This is a complete and mm-hmm. utter revamping. This is something entirely different in the vein of, but not directly co- connected to afterlife with Archie. 
that takes a historical, I don't want to say realistic, but a, a historical and quasi-factual perspective on being a witch and being Sabrina in the oh-so-modern year 1966. Well, that's, that's what I like about it is, if you remember uh, Sabrina, the Teenage Witch, the original Archie comic series, you know, she's mm-hmm. living with her two aunts and she's having crazy antics and adventures as her powers go crazy or she does something she's not supposed to and, and learns something from it. This series takes it from the perspective of witches are real. This is scary mm-hmm. stuff. This mm-hmm. is your worst nightmare come true. There's a woman with skulls in her eyes. Enjoy. Yes. All the terrible stuff that you've ever heard or read in the works of Anton LaVey is totally true in these books. Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. Totally, and, totally, you know, totally. The, the references, my God, the references. There are Stephen King references sprinkled throughout here. There's references to, to Shirley Jackson. There's references to classic horror stories. There's references to, you know, again, I, I can't say historical, but I don't want to not say historical. But historical perspectives on on uh, Wiccan and, and being a witch, yeah, and all of the, you know, there are references to the Salem witch trials, and not in the the goofy kind of jokey way that you sometimes see that in pop culture, but as an actual terrifying genocide of Sabrina's people, and it's mm-hmm. it's terrifying and wonderful and off putting, and by the way, this is something that I wanted to get off my chest, you know, Madam Satan, yeah. Mm-hmm. Madam Satan is a legitimate Archie Comics Golden Age superhero mm-hmm. from the year 1940. Mm-hmm. She made like three appearances. Yeah, Pep Comics or something, yeah. Fascinating to me that Archie, the uh, wholesome Kids Next Door comic, not only had Madam Satan, they also had a character named Mr. Satan, who did five appearances. But Madam Satan is a revamped version of the one comics character that I would swear to you they would never bring back from Archie Comics, and they do it in a way that... Calling her Madam Satan is the scariest thing I've read in forever. I oh yeah, love if you it. go if you go pick up the trade paperback, they actually have the first appearance of um, Madam Satan in the back, and so you can mm-hmm. read that complete first adventure uh, in there, that first story. Ashley, mm-hmm. what did you think uh, uh, going from the happy-go-lucky, uh, uh, funny Archie version of Sabrina into this chilling adventures of Sabrina? Uh, I don't care terribly much for the original version of Sabrina, mm-hmm. so I really like this version. Uh, <laughs> it's really great to read after you've watched Rosemary's Baby. Yeah, um, and like <laughs> like many children uh, of of my age, I really like witch stories. So this is like everything I want in a horror comic. Um, plus they murderize a Sabrina comics character who I didn't really ever like. So that's like super (laughs) satisfying for me personally. Um, I really appreciate the, um, things that Matthew doesn't want to call historical perspectives that are sprinkled throughout here. And, and the cultural touchstones that are put in place because you can tell with this book, like you can tell with afterlife with Archie, that there's a great deal of care that's gone into constructing these books. It's not just, golly gee wouldn't it be weird and interesting if we made sabrina right actually the evil witch that every conservative ever has you know been fearful of since america was america um and it's also great to see them leaning so hard into all these witchy rumors that we've seen throughout popular culture i i mean as long as it's exists before it's existed in its modern form it's beautiful and oh, yeah. terrifying. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mr. Mr. Hack of, of the apt last name does an amazing job. And I think what's so interesting about the Madam Satan character is that she's so similar to Fantima, who only predates her by like a couple years. Yeah. Um, and the whole time she shows up like that, I'm just waiting for her to turn blue the entire time. Like oh, that's no. all I could think. It is creepy uh, and I, when I first saw her. Yeah, she's, she's ter- so she's so you know, beautiful oh, and yeah. like so terrifying. You know, speaking of yeah. the art, uh, real quick, when I first started reading this, I, I was like, "Oh man, this feels so much like Rosemary's Baby," just from the the visual look of it. And then I was like, yeah. "Wow, this feels yeah. like I'm I'm looking at a Hitchcock film." And then mm-hmm. I, I'm like, "Oh, this is uh, what was the uh, the vampire uh, soap opera, the Dark Shadows." Dark Shadows, yeah. And oh it's like, yeah. Within the first page, all of these feelings are flooding over me as I'm looking at the art. And then mm-hmm. you start paying attention to, oh, uh, Betty Cooper is Marilyn Monroe and Veronica mm-hmm. Lodge is uh, is uh, Betty, uh, Page. Betty Page. 
And then you start oh. looking at the mm-hmm. faces of a lot of other characters and you're like, holy cow, this is getting really, really creepy. So the art in this, in my opinion, is fantastic. It's top notch. Also, All the, the Betty and Veronica um, um, cameos are, are like excellent. Just mm-hmm. Aren't they? So well contrived. So perfect and so beautiful. And the thing that really sells it for me is... When they go through this story and they bring in like a goofy cousin, English Ambrose. Mm-hmm. Oh, he's, he's so yeah. great. Yeah. I've read <laughs> stories with goofy cousin Ambrose and I'm like, oh my God, how are they going to make this character? They did it. They scared me. Oh my God. The, the, the things that really, really bother me about this book is not necessarily the implications of the blood and the violence or the implications of the sometimes subtextual, sometimes not even a little bit subtextual sex. It's the fact that these creators, like, they'll work back and forth between them. They, they work that extremely difficult line between your, your, your sex and death, to put it in the, in the bluntest Freudian <laughs> term. And you go, you're back and forth, and you ping pong around. But they handle all of it so well that you're still – creeped out even by parts that are clearly overtly sexy but they're not because they're terrible but they're not entirely terrible because they're a little bit overtly sexy and oh my god oh yeah i mean it's so the the story is uh sabrina is into what is it uh, greendale and Mm -hmm. she's about to turn 16 she uh we find some past history about her father wanted to conceive a daughter as a vessel for something and she, he had to do it by marrying a mortal woman, which uh, caused all sorts of kerfuffles with in the Wiccan community. And so he was kerfuffles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He was uh, he was uh, turned into a tree or Im- Im- embedded into a tree. Uh, the the two ants uh, start to raise Sabrina as as a uh, as a normal person. But uh, mm-hmm. and because of that, she's in regular high school. She has a regular human uh, mortal feelings, including love for uh, the 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 high school jock boy. And they start Harvey. to, yeah, they start. Harvey Kinkle. <laughs> Harvey Kinkle. They start to have a, a romance that blooms. And then, uh, then we find out that, um, um, Madam, uh, Madam Satan is back and she mm-hmm. was once, uh, a, a thing with Sabrina's uh, father and, uh, she wants some revenge. She does. And so she shows she up was, and causes she was all sorts thrown of thrown over by the father for Sabrina's mother. She, um, there's all sorts of shenanigans she wants to do. But on the Sabrina's 16th birthday, she's supposed to be, uh, to write her name in the book of Satan. And, mm-hmm. uh, unfortunately, Madam Satan has uh, arranged it so that Harvey shows up to break up the ceremony. And because he's uh, trespassed onto the, the secret ways, they kill him and Sabrina's mm-hmm. distraught and she does or participates in one of the worst things ever, raising the dead. Don't bury Harvey in the pet cemetery. Only it thing, never Rodrigo. Ends well. Yeah, well, Rodrigo, here's the part that is really creepy. We find out it's not Harvey in Harvey's body at the very end of the book. Oh, oh God. Right. Creepiest thing. Oh, no, he's going to make step. out with his daughter. Oh, no, right? Isn't that weird? Now, I, now I've, I've not read past the six issues. I know, Matthew, you have. Um, does that happen? It hasn't happened yet, but okay. it's because clearly gonna. Because I mean, after Harvey, quote unquote, disappears, Harvey's mother yep. comes to Sabrina and says, oh, I found this in his locker. I know you two were going to go out and have a special night on your 16th birthday. He didn't mind a long engagement. He was going to ask you to marry him. And it's like, ah. This book flirts with all the Victorian horrors, your patricide, your cannibalism. I mean, Honestly, it's almost like flowers in the attic level. It is. Mm -hmm. They are. I don't think they're going to shy away from the implication of spiritual incest. I don't because frankly, the stuff they've shown us is more horrifying in some ways, I guess, depending on who you are, your mileage always varies, whatever you got. But the stuff that they've shown us is as terrifying, if not more terrifying than the aspects there. But my God, the point in, in there's and I read these <laughs> when they came out and there's a point in I think issue three where the implication is Harvey is is we know he's dead the city doesn't know he's dead Sabrina knows he's dead but they don't know where he is and Hilda and Zelda keep trying to get her to eat yeah meat dishes yeah and she's she's like why are you trying to get me to oh 
Uh, you try- and this the very know, strong man? implication is that you know they're trying to. <laughs> Silent Green is made of Harvey. <laughs> but oh, the, the Saturday oh. Night Blue Plate Special is all Harvey. Oh. Yeah, and then-, then you get the most terrifying scene. The most terrifying scene is one panel near the end of issue five where everybody's trying to pretend that everything's back to normal. And you see that classic image of Archie, Betty and Veronica with three straws in mm-hmm. one soda. Mm-hmm. And there you just you can't look at that without seeing them covered in blood, dancing topless in the forest. And it's just like they've 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 done it. They've corrupted Archie. Yeah, well, but see, and, here's the, well here's the weirdest thing about that, though, is when Afterlife with Archie came out, I was like, holy crap, this is the craziest stuff ever. I mean, in Afterlife with Archie, Sabrina marries Cthulhu, right? Mm-hmm. And then sure. Chilling Adventures of Cthulhu or Chilling Adventures of Sabrina comes out. <laughs> <laughs> Chilling Adventures of Cthulhu. Chilling oh, Adventures of Cthulhu. That's a different book. Um, but Chilling kind of Adventures of Sabrina comes out and I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, so this is Sabrina and her marriage to Cthulhu. And it's like, no, this is a oh. whole different universe. This has nothing to do with afterlife with Archie. They're not the same thing, even though it's written by the same guy. Two different universes. Enjoy right. your horror tales uh, of Sabrina. Earth one. Yeah. Earth two. That's what it is. Earth cannibalism. Yeah. And, and I, I, I dug every minute of it. This book is hypnotic. It's haunting. It's, it's one of those rare cases where when, when we review comics, when I review a comic anyway, I try and look at it from the perspective, okay, well, the writer did all these things really good and the artist did all these things really good and the artist and the writer worked together here and this really worked. I cannot look at this book as the book of uh, Mr. Aguirre Sakasa and the work of Mr. Hack separately. This is something where it's just so intertwined and so perfect that I'm just like, this was created by witchcraft. It had to be. <laughs> they they cast a spell and they like uh, they chanted three times over over a cauldron and then this comic jumped fully formed. And oh my God, is it ever beautiful? Well, like with like with Afterlife with Archie, this is not a book for people that are squeamish. Now, this doesn't have zombies busting out and uh, uh, ripping people limb from limb, but this does have some bloody parts. It does have dead bodies. People are this ripped is, from limb from limb in these this, pages. To me, this is Just the equivalent of reading an eerie comics or a creepy comic. So you're you're looking at that level of gruesomeness in it. So this is definitely not something you want to hand to your kids. But I think if you want to see a different take on Sabrina, that you may really, really enjoy this. Now, that being said, what didn't work in this book, Rodrigo? What didn't work in this book? Um, I think the art is cool, but muddy. And when you're like going into it at first, it's very difficult to get a, a feel for who everyone is and what exactly is happening. Um I was like, I can't really tell which one's Hilda or, or yeah. Zelda and which one's, uh, where are they? Is it Hilda and Zelda? Hilda and Hilda, Zelda, yeah. Zelda, yeah. Yeah. Um, later on, it becomes less of a thing because they're kind of always a unit and it does become clearer. But early on in the introductions, I don't know. I, I felt that that first issue, because of that style, because of that, like, I don't know, old school EC kind of look. Mm-hmm. Um it it also made it a little bit difficult to get into. Um, there's there's always the slight nagging problem that uh, this is all based on the demonization of an actual religion uh, mm-hmm. back in the day. You know the 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 reluctance to call it a historical perspective. That's that's what it is, right? It's you yeah. know <laughs> it is just like a bunch of innocent people got killed in in Massachusetts. Yeah. You know. So there, there is that that kind of like hovers above it. This is very much like witches are in league with Satan. Um, all, there's like they have dark hearts and they eat people and they are bad things in the world, even if maybe they're not like the worst because, you know, our protagonist is a witch. Her caretakers are witches. Um, but it is just kind of has to like you have to allow for that um, in order to to get into it. Um, other than that, you know, uh, it's 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 kind of a thing. It's like if you're not into this kind of like, because this is this is this really harkens back to those old horror comics. Mm-hmm. If you're not into that, um, if you want a more four color thing, if you want um, 
a more a less impressionistic comic, then this might be off putting. Mm-hmm. Ashley, do you have anything that uh, is off putting for you in this book? Um, for me, there's really no negative. Um, but again, this plays into a lot of stuff that I like. So I'm definitely going in with blinders because mm-hmm. I like stories about witches. I like historical pieces. I like non-traditional art that breaks traditional storytelling formulas, unless it's superheroes. So um, for me, this has just so many buttons that I, w- I, I don't have any issues with it. I have um, I wouldn't recommend it for everyone. Mm-hmm. but um, I would hold this up as a great example of what comics can be and what Archie is doing. That is just so yeah. exciting right now. I, I agree. I think that's, that's really cool when Archie can say, you know what? We've been following the same art style, the same house style for, you know, 75 years. Let's try something different. And lo and behold, it works and people are excited about it. Let's continue these kinds of things. So you got to applaud a company when they can, break from such a strong tradition and go in this direction. And mm-hmm. it's probably why he's what now, um, um, Roberto is, um, chief creative officer like or chief executive, creative, executive officer. I forget creative. what his, his current title is at Archie, but, uh, if this is what Archie's going to continue to do, then I'm all for it. He's uh, the C3PO. There. Matthew, what are, what are ha, your, ha. what are you, what are your final thoughts on this book? This book is right in my wheelhouse because this is and you said creepy and eerie. I would go further. This is an, an etude, if you will, to pre code horror comics through the prism of the Archie kitty book titles. And as such, it's the nerdiest of nerdies because they are breaking down two different genres, which should not mix. The chocolate is fully ensconced in the peanut butter. And it so works for me simply because of the clear amount of love, the clear amount of research, the amount of just perspective that had to go into this. And Rodrigo is right. I mean, I, I, I have a friend who is a practicing Wiccan. She's a very nice soccer mom. And all of this stuff that is, that is being presented here as history would really, really irritate her. And, you know, rightfully so. So if you look at it for me from the perspective of, Can you take a funny book from the 40s and a horror book from the 50s, slam them together with the art of a guy from 1997 and put it on the page and make it work? The answer is absolutely not. There's no way they can do it. And the fact that they did is damn near miraculous. The fact that this came after Afterlife with Archie. When they announced it, Stephen and I had a discussion that I remember very clearly. We were both like, oh, my God, are they going to go back to this same well? Can they make this lightning hit the bottle? And I think they've done it. I think that this is a beautiful book. It's a great read for adults, for sure. Don't hand this to a child, for God's sake. Mm -hmm. And if you can get yourself past the specter of Melissa Joan Hart, which obviously is going to be an issue, I think that this is really a, a beautiful comic with a lot going for it. I will agree with many of Rodrigo's negatives and I will, I will echo the one thing that I think was most difficult for me is the fact that they keep referring to it as taking place in the present day and the present day that they're telling us is 1966. Yeah. And they finally lock that down about issue three where they're like the present day, which is to say 1966. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, clearly a period piece. And I can work with that because, you know, 50 years ago might as well be. Yeah, 50 years ago might as well be the depths of Mars. It Mm -hmm. might as well be an alien world. None of us, and Stephen and I, are pretty freaking old people. We're only four years years away from the start of this book. But that's not the point. We weren't born yet, and we don't get to say that very damned often. And so let me have this, Stephen. Okay. (laughs) Okay. You're old. So 1966. Shut up. None of us were born. (laughs) None of us has seen Bye Bye Birdie. Certainly we haven't sung Bye Bye Birdie. And we don't um, know who I've Betty seen Pink. Bye Bye Birdie. Thank you. Uh, I've seen <laughs> Bye Bye Birdie. Don't contradict me in front of the child. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I say go read it if you're over 18 and uh, not squeamish because people do get chopped up and not freaked out by, you know, the fact that witches are in league with Satan in this story. Cool. So uh, Matthew has a definite buy on this. Rodrigo, is this a buy, borrow or skip? 
Uh, I think it's a borrow. Um, there, it, like this is this is a quality book. There's a lot going on here, but it might be a little bit inaccessible if you like. This book is a combination of a thousand references, and if you don't have an in into it, it might be very daunting. Mm. So I would say um, definitely a borrow from a friend, um, unless. Any of the stuff we said, old school horror comics, Rosemary's Baby type stuff, or you just, you know, really like that weird uh, cat puppet uh, from the show <laughs> and want to want to see more of it. Um, this, this is probably an end. This is definitely a strong buy for me. If you are looking for something for your holiday uh, Halloween scare fest, this is definitely a book to pick up and read. I think it's a fun adventure and I don't think you will be disappointed Unless you give it to a young child and then you have to stay up with them for the next two months while they scream in the middle of the night. Ashley, is this a buy, skip, or borrow? Buy it if you're over 18 in a buying frenzy. Yes. Excellent. There you go. Rush right out. There you go. That's The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina out volume one. I believe it's been out for a couple of weeks now, maybe a month or so now. Uh, from Archie Comics. Definitely go check it out. And that wraps it up for our 700th issue. Thank you so much for listening, being part of the Major Spoilers experience. We'll be back next week to see what happens when the worst person of the world becomes president. Because we know that you love comics, and we do too. And we will talk with you soon. Stop talking about comic books or I'll kill you. I don't care if the Hulk could defeat the man of steel. Podcast is copyright 2016 by Major Spoilers Entertainment, LLC.